Well, uh, I think I'll begin. Let, uh, welcome. It's wonderful to see so many people uh, thundering into this, uh, the first of our uh, 2000, 2021 Stanton lectures that are lectures given in the Faculty of Divinity in um, Philosophical Theology and Philosophy of Religion. Uh, my name is Janet Soskis, and I'm Professor Emerita of Philosophical Theology at Cambridge and currently the William K. Warren Research Professor of Catholic Theology at Duke Divinity School. And I'm also chair of the Standing Committee. So it's a real pleasure for me to say on behalf of the committee to uh, welcome you all, but to welcome Professor Olivier Boulnois uh, to give these lectures. Uh, Professor Boulnois is the Director of Studies at the Ecole Pratique des Autotudes in Paris and also Professor at L'Institut Catholique. Uh, he's a well-known specialist in the philosophy and history of the Middle Ages, going into early modernity and indeed into modernity. Um, for his work, he's well known on Duns Scotus, Augustine, medieval metaphysics and theology, and the reception moving into modern philosophy as well. So he's written on almost everything that everyone could be interested in, onto theology, the body. I've run across most recently his work on beauty and divine names, where we were together at a conference. So there's any number of intersections with interests we have at Cambridge and those of you coming in from around the world may have. And we're naturally extremely excited that um, Professor Bounois uh, is apparently pushing his researches further back historically into an even earlier period uh, in these Stanton lectures, which are on the theme of Paul and philosophy. So without further ado, Professor Bounois, over to you. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. <clears throat> Professors, dear colleagues, dear friends, allow me to express my gratitude to the electors of the Stanton lecture Lectureship for the confidence they have placed in me and for the honor of being listed among the prestigious holders of the Stanton Lectures. I am fully aware of my limitations in the face of the difficult question I have chosen to deal with, Paul and are devoted to the philosophy of religion, it seems to me that the most urgent question in that this discipline could address was the meaning of Christianity. What is the essence of Christianity? Starting from a philosophical approach, the question becomes, is it possible to express the heart of the Christian experience through philosophical concepts? And it seemed to me that a philosophical reading of Paul was the best way to lead us there. Pauline experience is a Christian, i.e. messianic experience of existence. As such, it shows that the new relationship of man to the world, to others, to himself, and finally to God is possible. This is why I will first analyze man's relationship to the world that surrounds and encloses him, the ambient world. Then I will study his relationship to others. Finally, I will study his relationship to himself. These three relationships to the world, to others, and to oneself are the accessible modalities of the relationship to the inaccessible God. The relationship to the world passes away is the foundation of this will be the subject of lecture two. The relationship to others refers us to charity. Five. And these two attitudes are the conditions of possibility for thinking in the mode of faith and a direct relationship to God, lecture six. But I will begin today with the form of Paul's discourse the wisdom of the cross. Before reaching the fundamental concepts of Paul's thought, we must study the form of his discourse. In this way, we can see how he expresses the fundamental phenomena of Christianity and how they are articulated. We must therefore study the word of the cross, logos to stauru, in the first epistle to the Corinthians, a logos that predates all philosophy and all theology. 
My first part will deal with the interpretation of Wittgenstein and Heidegger, and I will show the importance of Luther's interpretation for Heidegger. My second part will be dedicated to a close reading of Paul in order to clarify the scope of the destruction and of the new beginning he realized. So, <clears throat> uh, the, in, the recent interpretation of Paul, first of all. What is the word of the cross? In order to elucidate this concept, we must first confront two difficulties. One, the discourse of the cross invoked by Paul is a religious discourse. As such, it would escape all conceptual rationality. Two, in the case of authentic Christianity, faithful to this discourse of the cross, a philosophy of religion seems impossible. The first difficulty was formulated by Wittgenstein and the second by Heidegger. First of all, Wittgenstein. In one of his remarks in Culture and Value, Wittgenstein alludes to the first epistle to the Corinthians. I quote, religion as foolishness is a foolishness that comes from irreligiosity. So facing the madness of unbelief stands like an inverted image in a mirror, the madness of faith. Human life is a choice between these two madnesses. For Wittgenstein, religious faith has nothing to do with a belief whose content could be analyzed and whose epistemological status could be dissected. It is a way, I quote, a way of life, a call to conscience, a passionate decision. End of quotation. To be sure, faith involves statements, but no one has the right to make them his own unless they are a torment to, a torment to him, excuse me. Religion is, is simply not of the order of propositional statements. It must be exercised in the first person as a set of emotions and behaviors that found a new relationship to the world. Wittgenstein's objection is all the more powerful because it gets to the heart of the phenomenon, much more closely, I think, than epistemological analysis of the status of belief. According to Wittgenstein, nothing can be said about the truth of Christianity. For that, one must live it. The believer's certainty rests on the adoption of a form of life. I quote, everything in his life obeys the rule of this belief. Hence, his radical thesis, I quote, if Christianity is the truth, then, then all philosophy about it is false not because philosophers make mistakes that could be corrected, but because as a matter of principle, it is impossible to say from the outside what Christianity means. What matters here is to grasp it from within, to live it oneself in the first person. The same applies to ethical or aesthetic experience. To use an example from Wittgenstein, all that can be said about the Bruckner symphony is nothing compared to the storm of emotions that we feel when listening to it. We need to experience it. Thus, the ethical, the aesthetic, and the religious can be experienced. They can even be shown, but they cannot be said. For what underlies the language games specific to religions are not ways of seeing, but ways of living. Religious experience is one of those things, I quote, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be kept silent, schweigen, as the last proposition of the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus puts it. There is indeed good reason to insist on the non-propositional character of religious experience. As Agamben showed, even in professing his faith, Paul uses the expression to believe in Jesus, Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah, 
should not be conceived as a verbal phrase where the verb is understated. Paul does not believe in the, in the fact that Jesus, Jesus is Messiah, but as a nominal phrase in its own right. For the nominal phrase does not describe a state of affairs or a situation. It posits an absolute in a timeless, impersonal, non-modal way. Messiah is not an external and separable predicate, but a truth intrinsic to the event Jesus, an absolute. Contrary to what theories of belief maintain from Augustine to Buber, this faith is not a is not a judgment. The believer does not maintain that Jesus has the quality of being Messiah. Rather, he is seized by him. Faith is an act by which man does not judge, but by which, but by which he is put to the test before the judgment of God. As Karl Barth strongly emphasized in his book on the epistle to the Romans, through faith, human existence is put into crisis. And yet, this does not forbid an analysis of attitude towards this experience. Just because the content of religious experience is mystical in the Wittgensteinian meaning, uh, this does not mean that we should give up talking about its, its human side, its experiential side. We can therefore recognize at once the, unsay the unsayable character of this content, and at the same time, we can undertake to describe the form of life that makes it possible. The second difficulty concerns the very possibility of attaining a knowledge of God and of elaborating a rational discourse on God. In the West, the fundamental problem of thinking about God, from Augustine to Heidegger, is to understand how two apparently con contradictory Pauline propositions are articulated. First epistle to the Corinthians 1.20, I quote, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And Romans 1.20, the invisible things of God, his eternal power and divinity, are seen by thought in his works from what has been created. Are we to think that the knowledge of God enjoyed by the pagans is part of the wisdom of the world? If so, it is annihilated with it. Or is there a compatibility between these two texts and which one? This text has nourished Heidegger's thinking. He commented on this passage at least three times. Let us examine uh, quickly these three occurrences. In the 1920 course, Introduction to the Phenomenology of Religion, Heidegger still believed that, I quote, the unveiling of the connections between religious phenomena would provide authentic criteria for refounding Christian theology and Western philosophy, end of quotation. But uh, within a discourse of philosophical wisdom, the first epistle to the Corinthians was the main difficulty to overcome. When Paul writes, the logos of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, Heidegger comments, to, do, to those who are called, the gospel is strength and contains the fundamental fulfillment of faith. If one resorts to the wisdom of the world, I quote once more, it is a fall, whereas the word of the cross is, I quote, the factitious experience of the whole of life. So the logos of the cross is accessible by faith alone. It is not based on any human wisdom, but allows a truthful experience of existence. Heidegger thus sees in the phenomenological interpretation of the early Christian form of life, the condition of possibility for, I quote, 
the destruction of Christian theology and Western philosophy. The problem that must then be elucidated does not simply belong to phenomenological hermeneutics, but, says Heidegger, it is, I, I, I quote, the fundamental problem of existence in the context of destruction. What destruction is at stake? Heidegger clearly alludes to the following verse from Paul, 119. Uh, <clears throat> I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent I will take away. It is therefore from the beginning of his path of thought that the Heideggerian gesture of destroying the improper concepts of metaphysics appear. And from the start, it is based on a Pauline foundation. It is the interpretation of Paul that allows the destruction of the fundamental concepts of Western philosophy. Where does this interpretation come from? To build his course, Heidegger relies on Luther, from whom he retains three theses taken from the dispute of Heidelberg, 1518. First thesis, he is not rightly called a theologian, I quote Luther, quoted by Heidegger, uh, he is not rightly called a theologian who sees by thought from what has been created the invisible things of God. So to deserve the name of theologian, one must not take Romans 120 at face value. The path of natural theology, inspired by philosophical speculation about creation, is a dead end. Second quotation of Luther. The theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. The theologian of the cross says what the thing is. Philosophical speculation leads to excusing man and accusing God. Only the consideration of sinful, weak, and unhappy man is phenomenological. Third quotation of Luther by Heidegger. This wisdom, which perceives the invisible things of God from works, swells, blinds, and hardens completely. For Heidegger, Luther is the hermeneutical key that opens Paul's epistles. And I quote, Luther opened a new understanding of early Christianity. He therefore relies on the Lutheran opposition between faith and works. Analyzing Paul's fundamental attitude, he sums up the teaching of Paul in one very Lutheran sounding sentence. I quote, this is Heidegger, fulfilling the law is impossible Everyone fails in this attempt. Faith alone justifies. This allows him to contrast two logoi. On the one hand, metaphysical contemplation is inauthentic. I quote, when God is grasped primarily as an object of speculation, it is a failure in terms of authentic understanding. On the other hand, a true theology of the cross, i.e. a phenomenological interpretation of fallible existence, has never been attempted, I quote, because Greek philosophy has imposed itself on Christianity. Luther alone made a breakthrough in this direction, and this explains his hatred of Aristotle. End of quotation. Here, the hermeneutical circle is completed. Since Paul is interpreted in a Lutheran spirit, the only one who really fulfilled the Pauline program is Luther, who proceeds to destroy Aristotle. Indeed, Heidegger identifies what must be destroyed, the theology of glory, with the Hellenization of Christianity. The condemnation of the wisdom of the world becomes that of natural theology. Paul rejected in advance 
the turn of patristic theology towards Platonism and the idea that one could, um, <clears throat> could access God by following the path of a metaphysical contemplation of the world. He excluded by anticipation the way in which, I quote, the elaboration of Christian doctrine is oriented towards Greek philosophy. Luther thus makes it possible to return to authentic Paulinism, to the proto-Christian revolution against speculation about God, against Platonizing dogmatics and Aristotelian metaphysics. Indeed, in a new interpretive layer, Heidegger reads the Lutheran interpretation of Paul with Harnack's glasses. It was, of course, Harnack who inspired the concept of the Hellenization of Christianity. And it was from this perspective that he thought of the Pauline religious experience. The object of the phenomenology of religion is, for Heidegger, to free the core of authentic Christianity from this metaphysical bark. It is a question of elucidating religious experience in its, uh, in its actual reality against the metaphysics inspired by Plato and Aristotle. The starting point of Heidegger's destruction of metaphysics is thus his reading of Paul, but Heidegger's Paul is read through Luther, and Paul and Luther are themselves read through Harnack. Therefore, far from being naive, this destruction is based on a series of interpretations. Three years later, in 1924, or four years later, uh, in a paper given at Bultmann's seminar on the problem of sin in Luther, Heidegger sketches out an important turning point. Here again, he places his hermeneutics of existence in a Pauline and Lutheran perspective. Commenting on the Heidelberg dispute, he notes, I quote, Luther there very clearly characterizes the task of theology by opposing two theological perspectives. One is the theology of glory, which considers the invisible God from his works. On the, other, on the other hand, the theology of the cross, which, start, I quote, which starts exclusively from the real and effective situation, which says what the thing is. Dikit quod res est, says Luther. Heidegger summarizes the, the opposition in two sentences. The scholastic only becomes aware of Christ in retrospect after having determined the being of God and the world. This Greek perspective of the scholastics makes man proud, but he must first go to the cross before he can say, it quod res est, what the thing is. End of quotation. One cannot start from worldly being and then think of God. Rather, one must start from the truth about man. This is humbling. It is the fall. <clears throat> I quote once more. One can only understand faith if one understands sin. And one can only understand sin if one has an exact understanding of man's own being. Here we see the extent to which Heidegger distorts Luther. For Luther, the theology of the cross was the economy of salvation, revelation, incarnation, and faith. Heidegger sees in the analysis of the fallen man, his real and effective condition, the description of his facticity, what the thing is, his factual existence. Sin, characterize the true hermeneutics of human existence. On the other hand, all speculative discourse on God, all natural theology must be destroyed. What must, what must first be established is an analysis of the essence of man, of which religious behavior is only a byproduct. In these key concepts, we see 
the project of being in time already outlined. Heidegger's third reference to the Epistle to the Corinthians is found in the 1935 course, Introduction to Metaphysics. I quote, what is properly asked in this question, the question of metaphysics, is for faith a folly. Philosophy lies in this folly. End of quotation. Of course, it's a clear echo of Corinthians 1.20. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world, etc.? Heidegger suggests here that what is for Paul foolishness? In Greek, the word, the word moria refers not to raging madness, but to madness as imbecility, which the Vulgate rightly translates stultitia. So, foolishness for Heidegger is Aristotelian metaphysics. Paul, i.e. Luther, shows that wisdom proper, i.e. metaphysics, is foolishness, and that God is not a philosophical object. But since metaphysics fulfills the essence of philosophy, Heidegger concludes that what the theologian must reject is philosophy as such. The analysis concludes with the famous phrase, a Christian philosophy is a square circle. It is now clear that this interpretation <clears throat> forbidding the existence of a Christian philosophy and of a philosophy of religion, this interpretation was made possible by a tendency to identify Paul with Luther. But now we are on the other side of the Pauline Lutheran cut. Now, Heidegger is on the side of what is rejected as foolishness, that is philosophy, which means that philosophy must not deal with God. He therefore uses Paul to abandon his project of hermeneutics of the Christian religion. Paul's role in the economy of Heidegger's thought has thus been completely reversed. Whereas in the 1920s, the reading of Paul allowed for the elaboration of a phenomenology of religion from 1935 onwards, it serves, it serves to establish a philosophy, uh, uh, excuse me, it serves to establish that a philosophy of, of Christian religion is impossible. But now, is this analysis really faithful to Paul? And to Luther. First of all, we must emphasize that in Luther, the Pauline opposition between the logos of the world and the logos of the cross becomes an opposition between two theologies. By opposing the theology of glory to the theology of the cross, Luther takes up in his own way the Pauline opposition between the flesh that glories in the sight of God, 1 Corinthians 1.29, and the word of the cross, 1.18, but he transposes it within theology, between two kinds of science of God. Thus, the alternative remains rooted in the medieval problematic. Therefore, the science that swells according to Paul becomes in Luther the theology of glory. In contrast, only the humbling world of the cross can build up because it is based on faith in the divine power and incarnation of the Messiah. In Luther, it becomes the theology of the cross. Thus, instead of seeking to reconcile Romans 1 with uh, 1 Corinthians 1, Luther exacerbates their contradiction. Rational knowledge of God, based on his works, does not save. It is not enough to know God in his majesty. The wisdom of the world is rejected. It is vanity, that is, it is the theology of glory. It must be supplanted by the theology of the cross. 
this position is based on the core of Lutheran theology. Both Romans 1 and Corinthians 1 are explained from the radical opposition between works and grace. In order to act and think correctly, one must first abolish the egocentric structure of human existence, which seeks only its own work and not the true good. Only the theology of the cross destroys man's good works, which include the knowledge of God. The, the theology of the cross says what the thing is. It destroys the moral pretensions of man, which includes the metaphysical knowledge of God. The wisdom of the world is what depends on man, or so he thinks. But he must discover that everything depends on God and nothing on him. He must no longer rely on his works, not even on the concepts he develops. Even in order to know God, he must rely only on divine grace. In this connection, Luther says, quote, he who has not yet been, excuse me, he who has not yet been destroyed, reduced to nothing by the cross, this one attributes works and wisdom to himself and not to God, and so abuses and defies the gifts of God. The theology of glory is so called because it glories in its works instead of glorying in the world, in the Lord, excuse me, glorying in the Lord. Uh, by taking man as the principle of its works, the wisdom of the world rests on its, on its own merit. It thinks it is something while it is nothing. In marked con contrast, the proclamation of the theology of the cross <clears throat> um, excuse me, in Mark, the proclamation of the theology of the cross has a sharp force, both destructive and constructive. Its purpose is to make man recognize that without God's grace, his works are nothing. One must be destroyed in one's works in order to be built up by grace. Natural theology, which relies on man's power, is doomed to destruction and only a theology that relies on God's grace, faith, and the cross can build and construct. Yet, contrary to what Heidegger believes, Luther is in perfect continuity with a part of patristic and medieval thought. And he reactivates here the medieval criticism of theology, which is as old as theology itself. As soon as Abelard invented Theologia in the 12th century, William of Saint-Thierry and Bernard of Clairvaux attacked it. Saint Bernard mocked, Abel, mocked Abelard's Theologia by calling it Stultilogia, uh, which translates stupidology, foolish talk, which is a caustic application of the vocabulary of 1 Corinthians to the natural theology inspired by Romans 1.20. Above all, we should not forget that Luther's interpretation is Christ-focused. I quote the Heidelberg controversy. It is not sufficient or profitable for anyone to know God in his glory and majesty unless he also knows him in the humility and ignominy of the cross. The Lutheran distinction between the theology of glory and the theology of the cross corresponds to the Augustinian opposition between the face, facies, and the back of God, posteriori dei. The face of God is the unchanging essence of the Godhead. The back of God is its manifestation in the flesh of Christ. Augustine believed that the divine homeland, the Godhead, can be known by means of the natural theology of the philosophers, but that the way to reach it lies in the mediator, Christ. One must therefore start from the economy of salvation, the manifestation of God and the incarnation. However, in his philosophical recovery of the theology at Crucis, Heidegger passes over in silence this Christological and economic dimension, 
so essential in Augustine and Luther. Moreover, we must emphasize that Luther criticizes theologians, not theology. What is at stake is not the validity of the knowledge of God, but the use that man makes of it in his concrete existence. For example, in his commentary on the epistle to the Romans, Luther fully accepts the validity of natural theology. I quote, all men have had a manifest knowledge of God, and this is especially true of idolaters. Precisely, in order to worship several gods, one must have the idea of God, which is implanted in us by God. So the fault of the pagans lies not in their idea of God, but in their use of it. Paul wants to emphasize that both Gentiles and Judeans are inexcusable, Romans 1.20. The Gentiles, because they knew God from creation and fell into idolatry and gave themselves over to vices. The Judeans, because they knew God through law and were not faithful to, to this law. The fault of the Gentiles lies not in their knowledge, but in their worship. Romans 1.21, though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God and give him thanks. And it is precisely this perverted knowledge that Augustine already called natural theology. But in Luther, the opposition is no longer an articulation between the homeland and the way, as in Augustine, it is radicalized because it is rooted in the contradiction between works and grace. I quote once more Luther. This is evident because in ignoring Christ, he, the theologian of glory, he ignores the God hidden in his sufferings. Thus, he prefers works to sufferings and glory to the cross, power to weakness, wisdom to folly, and in general, good to evil. To prefer works is both to prefer to know God through his creation and not through Christ, and to prefer to access the good through one's own works and not through grace. Luther's identification of the wisdom of the Logos with the theology of glory and of the foolishness of the cross with the theology of the cross is based on the idea that human works are absolutely vain without the grace that comes from the cross. Idolaters are those who want to serve him with works of their choice, says Luther. Luther rests his position on an interpretation of human nature as radically destroyed by original sin and incapable by itself of any correct and right act. Thus, the Lutheran interpretation of the wisdom of the world as a theologia gloriae is based on his own version of the Augustinian theology of grace, i.e. precisely on his interpretation of Paul. Furthermore, the Heideggerian interpretation is based on a selective misreading of Luther. Heidegger selects the negative arguments directed against scholastic theology, thus against the metaphysical Hellenization of Christianity. But he leaves out all the positive arguments which concern the economy of salvation in Jesus Christ. Moreover, Heidegger, consciously or not, confuses the condemnation of an attitude, idolatry, uh, salvation by works, with the criticism of a discipline, metaphysics. This interpretation encounters two other difficulties. The first is the idea, difficult to support today, that with Paul, we reach a pure religious life free of all Hellenism. By following close to Paul, it is clear that he uses typically Greek concepts, images, and forms of discourse. We will come back to this. For the moment, let us just mention the stoic concepts of conscience, natural law, indifferent acts, etc., which occupy a central place in Paul's thought. The image of the community as one body, 
the use of the literary genre of a diatribe, the philosophical genre of consolation, all this shows a consummate mastery of Hellenic culture. Second difficulty, from the very point of view of Paul's interpretation, this systematization is problematic. Beyond its deformations, the Heideggerian interpretation of the destruction of theology depends on the Lutheran definition of theologia gloriae, that is, on his interpretation of the epistle to the Romans. Now, Luther in, Luther, in turn, radicalizes the Augustinian inter interpretation of Romans 5, 7, and 9, an interpretation that I will challenge in my fourth and fifth lectures. Without anticipating my entire criticism, I will simply say that the opposition between faith and works is not Pauline. Even in the epistle to the Romans, dedicated to the salvation of Judeans and Gentiles by the grace of God, Paul writes, it's Romans 2, 6, 7, God will repay according to each one's works. To those who by endurance in good works, ergo agathu, seek glory and honor and incorruptibility, he will give eternal life. This may be a theology of glory, but here glory is taken in good part. I come now to the second part, the status of Logos in Paul. What can we answer to the double criticism of Wittgenstein and Heidegger? Does Pauline Christianity reside in a form of life that escapes description? Should we reserve all discourse on faith for a theology of revelation? On the contrary, I will show that a philosophy of Christian religion is possible starting from the logic of religious experience, according to Paul. This logic must first elucidate the status of the Pauline Logos. How should we understand uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18? The Logos of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are saved to us, it is the power of God. From the outset, Paul places himself not on the level of a theology, which does not yet exist, but on that of the Logos. Moreover, he contrasts not the glory and the cross, but the wisdom of the world and the foolishness of the cross. What does Logos to Stauru, word of the cross, mean? In the ancient world, crucifixion is such an atrocious, obscene, and ignominious punishment that no other description of a no other detailed description of a crucifixion is found in all ancient literature except in the Gospels. The cross is precisely unnameable. We can therefore understand the expression logos to storu in three ways from the most obvious to the most radical. First, as an objective genitive, the logos of the cross is a discourse that announces beyond the unnameable the singular event uh, of the Messiah. Second, as a subjective genitive, it is the logos that arises from the cross. Paul transmits a word that comes from this principal event. Three, as a subjective genitive with explanatory value. What speaks is the very word that is the cross. The event of the cross is itself a logos. The cross speaks and Paul is only its spokesman. I will privilege this latter strong sense, which does not exclude the other two. It is only in the Messiah 
that the cross where God manifests himself as love, which reveals itself by giving itself. Although this event is incomprehensible, inaccessible to human logos, it is the condition in which the phenomenon of the Messiah manifests itself. Without him, God would remain the logos, but a metaphysical logos, the thought of thought of Aristotle, the homeland uh, of the Godhead in uh, Augustine, the absolute knowledge of Hegel. To let the cross speak is to make us understand that the Messiah, the king announced in advance to restore justice, succumbed to the most ignoble of deaths. We proclaim a crucified Messiah, 1, 1 Corinthians 1, 23. Thus, the word of the cross is not the story of a failure, but the paradoxical admission of a victory. Messiahship has overcome death in resurrection, the fine edge of the paradox being not so much his resurrection as his passing, as his passing through death and an unnameable death. How can such an event be understood philosophically? What does Paul mean when he says, has not God made foolish, a Mohammed, the wisdom of the world? It, is it, as Heidegger says, an attack on metaphysics? I quote once more Heidegger, will Christian theology take the apostles' words seriously and consequently consider philosophy as folly. Can we, according to him, relate Paul's formula, the Greeks seek wisdom, Hellenes, Sophian, Zitusin, to the Aristotelian approach to metaphysics, which Aristotle calls Zetumene episteme, science which is thought? Maybe, but not only. Metaphysics is only the tip of the iceberg, the quintessence of Sophia. In Greek, Sophia refers to all kinds of knowledge, from medicine to philosophy to the art of playing an instrument. The term spontaneously evokes the sophists, those masters of knowledge who teach how to be always right. And precisely, philosophy is not wisdom. The philosopher is the, one who, is the one who knows that he does not possess it. The Pauline destruction is thus, much, is thus much more general than that of Heidegger. It concerns not only metaphysics, but all human knowledge. Is it an attack on philosophy in general? This is suggested by Alain Badiou, for whom Paul attacks Greek wisdom head on. I quote Badiou, the problem is to know how, armed with the only conviction that declares the event Christ, one can approach the Greek intellectual milieu whose essential category is wisdom and whose instrument is rhetorical superiority. Hence, should we classify Paul as an anti-philosopher? Certainly not. It would be a form of pretentiousness for philosophy to claim to be still the center of attention. It is clear that Paul is attacking all forms of Greek knowledge, including rhetoric. His opponent is the wisdom of the world taken as a whole. His rival is not only the philosopher, but also the sophist, for example. And in Paul, as we shall see, the world always refers to the the, 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 the term, the word world always refers to the old world, the one that resists the newness of the Messiah. The wisdom of the world is that of the old man, of the one who ignores the Messiah and cannot receive him. For Paul, the question is, what convinced the Corinthians? Was it the possession of the ancient logos of the world? or the dispossession implied by the new word of the cross, that is, by the cross itself. If Paul has a fairly good mastery of the Greek logos, 
This does not mean that his epistles depend on philosophy, Greek knowledge, or Hellenic rhetoric, even in order to oppose them. Paul is neither an orator nor a philosopher, but nor is he an anti-philosopher. He is precisely trying to give language to an absolutely new experience, but to do so, he has to use the ancient language. Think of Wittgenstein. The meaning of, the, of a word is its use in language. Arranged in a new context, oriented by a new situation, the word used by Paul will receive a new meaning. Paul has to deal with the established language, but he reorganizes it. Even in the case of proto-Christianity, there is no pure origin. What is the new use and meaning of Logos in Paul? How is it marked by the messianic event? How does he grapple with existing wisdoms? Paul is not unaware of the fact that he uses the tools of rhetoric, nor that he applies philosophical concepts. He does not reject the Greek logos as such. It is not only the Greek world, but also, as we shall see, the Judean world, which constitutes the logos of the ancient world. But Paul reconfigures it by listening to a new logos, the word of the cross. This implies a work on oneself and a struggle against the dominant culture. The rejection of Greek knowledge is not a rejection of logos as a ratio or rationality as such, but the difficult birth of another logos of a new rationality. If Paul fights the wisdom of the logos, it is to make room for another wisdom, the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 2, 7. Can we free Paul from the interpretations that disfigure him? Can we traverse his medieval and modern reception? Beyond the Heideggerian reading, beyond the Lutheran reading, what does Paul really say about his own logos? Instead of reading the first epistle to the Corinthians in light of Greek philosophy, it might be better to refer to, refer to biblical thought and to Paul's concrete situation. Indeed, Paul's diatribe is in, light, in line sorry, with the biblical reflection on wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, true wisdom advises the believer to beware of foreign wisdom personified as the foreign woman with flattering words, this is 7 5, which is sufficient to observe her precepts, uh, I'm sorry, while it is sufficient to observe her precepts with simplicity. Keep my precepts and you will live. In accordance with this exhortation, Paul relies on the word of God alone rather than on the understanding of the wise. In 119, he takes up Isaiah 29, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and hide the intelligence of the intelligent. His attitude also echoes the wisdom of, Sol of Solomon, according to which uh, the acquisition of wisdom does not come from man's effort, but from God's grave, uh, sorry, from God's grace. This is... Uh, complete mistake. Um, and it was already wisdom to know from whom grace comes. Uh, wisdom of, Sol of Solomon, chapter 8. As for Paul's concrete situation, we must listen to his, to his speech, not as a treatise on theology, even the theology of the cross, but as an act of speech. An act of speech that has three elements a situation of utterance, a relationship with the addressee, and a statement. First of all, situation of utterance. The beginning of the first epistle to the Corinthians responds to a precise situation. In Corinth, divisions have arisen between groups 
that call upon different masters. For Paul, these rivalries stem from the fact that the Corinthians received this, their teachers in faith as masters of wisdom. Second element, the effect on the recipients. Paul wants to act on his readers. He wants to re-establish unity. I urge you all to hold the same logos. 1.10. To speak the same language, the Corinthians must, must turn to the logos they have in common. The unity of the community can be based on nothing less than the word of the cross, that is, on the unique gospel of the Messiah, which is more essential than the gospel according to Apollos, the gospel according to Cephas, or to Paul himself. The assembly of believers, Ecclesia, has been called together by one and the same call, Clesis, in 126. And Paul, himself called to be an apostle, proclaims it to those who are also called. The gospel is not only the good news that salvation is available to all, but it is bo both the proclamation of the event of the cross and the event of, this, of that proclamation. It does not simply say, you can be saved, and this is how. It is in itself a beautiful novelty, a power he has experienced, a world that invades his life, that saves him. And it is in receiving it that the Corinthian community will be built. And third element, the statement. The Logos Paul proclaims is not a discourse like any other. Paul claims no authority for himself. He even minimizes what he has authored. Even if he baptized some of the Corinthians, this does not create a school. Indeed, he was not imparting wisdom. I quote, the Messiah did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, not in the wisdom of the Logos and Sophia Lugu, so that the cross of the Messiah might not be emptied. Kenote. The gospel is a challenge to the Logos of wisdom. What Paul has to transmit is an event that happens through a word, the impact of the messianic event. To use any, long, any other form of logos, the glamour of eloquence would, would be to veil its naked truth and to deactivate all its power. The word is about, this word is about truth, like philosophy, but it is an event not a demonstrative discourse. It is appropriate to propose the nakedness, the simplicity, and the poverty of the word, to announce the messianic event with anything other than this, i.e. human wisdom or power, would be to empty it of its content and to fall back into the nothingness of one's own word. Hence, our key phrase, the word of the cross is foolishness for those who are lost, but for those who are saved, for us, it is the power of God. The word can only be effective by being transparent to its content, the cross, without being seduced by the foreign wisdom spoken of in Proverbs. The word of the cross is sharp and performative, because the event of the cross is itself a two-sided phenomenon. It operates a sorting, a judgment. For those who know only the wisdom of the world, it manifests itself as idiocy, and they reject it, and they are lost. But for the others, those who accept it and receive it, it manifests itself as faith, as saving power. The verbs are in the present tense. This word, this word makes a radical break in humanity. It decides now and forever the existence of Paul does not only mean that this logos appears subjectively as foolishness, 
to those who are lost and has power to those who are saved, but also that God acts through foolishness. It pleased God to save by the foolishness of proclamation, 121. And that in this act, he himself becomes foolishness. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, 125. If the Messiah reveals himself to be the power of God, he is no less the foolishness of God. It is as foolishness that he is power, that is ultimately the wisdom of God. But in a sense, that totally overturns the wisdom of man. Paul supports his demonstration with two proofs. First proof, the recipient. The community of Corinth testifies that it is not necessary to be wise to receive the messianic event. In it, not many of you are wise according to the flesh, not many are powerful, 126. Second proof, the enunciator, Paul himself. Paul himself has not come according to the loftiness of words or wisdom, for he says, I did not judge that I knew anything among, among you except the Messiah Jesus and the Messiah crucified. It's in 2, 1 and 2. So the word of the cross is not one aspect of the gospel among others. It polarizes all aspects of the believer's new experience. In its raw simplicity, it is the only content that Paul proclaimed. It is the only criterion that brings the community together. It is in it alone that the call consists and in it alone that the power of God is manifested. On the contrary, by the mere fact of wanting to accomplish himself in a wisdom, man interposes an obstacle between himself and God. By this, he shields himself from God and he ceases to be open to his action. From then on, he exposes himself to destruction. The wisdom of this world, whether it takes the form of the scribe's knowledge of the Jewish scriptures or the direction of a philosophical school, as in the case of the disputant, this worldly wisdom, not in spite of, but because of all the skills it can boast of, <clears throat> this worldly wisdom has proved to be foolish. It was destroyed by an unprecedented unprecedented event, the proclamation of the cross. This is why when God wants to renew his relationship with man, he does not present himself as wisdom, but in the opposite form, that of foolishness. He can only reach man by taking a form that the world turns away from with horror and contempt, the form of the cross. Because it is nonsense, this word breaks through the shell of knowledge within which man locks himself in order to protect himself from the insecurity of existence. In this way, it re-establishes communication with the true Sophia to Theu, the wisdom of God. Just as the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone, the word that the wise men of this world rejected became the foundation. Paul then examines the world in its greatest division. The Judeans ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. Both cling to their ancient habits. The Judeans ask God's power for miracles to authenticate the proclamation. The Greeks seek to build an edifice of knowledge that protects them from the revelation of the living God. So it is their highest achievement that causes their hardening and failure. But the only effective proclamation is the one that offers itself defenselessly to the reprobation of the world, of Judeans and Greeks. It alone can reach men who have armored themselves against it. For the Judeans, it is a scandal that is a counter sign, the contradiction 
of the image they have of the expected Messiah. And for the Greeks, it is foolishness, that which is least acceptable to Greek wisdom, that which is most ridiculous and most obscene. This is how the proclamation of the Messiah will reach the many. Therefore, this praise of foolishness has a revolutionary aspect. The new word is not addressed to the learned elite. <clears throat> it, requires, it requires no sophia, no competence. Precisely because the holders of knowledge resist it, those who receive the logos of the cross are the fools, the ignorance, the scum of the earth. Neither birth nor power can guarantee justification. That is why the word is addressed to the many. As Matthew 11 will say, you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Those who are called are witnesses to this. This initially unbearable proclamation has been turned into a gospel, a saving message. The element that has enabled them to recognize the gospel as such is the effective initiative of God who has called them. They stop looking for signs or for wisdom because once they have passed through helplessness and foolishness, they discover that wisdom and power exist, but, they, they, but that they do not belong to them. The word of the cross deploys an asymmetrical strategy that moves from the weak to the strong, passing through weakness and foolishness is what makes, what makes it effective against the smooth talkers. Its action is truly communicational. It reaches its addressee at the heart of his existence. So, despite the tension exacerbated by Luther, 1 Corinthians 1 is compatible with Romans 1.20. Man knew God, but he did not want to recognize him. He did not transform himself in order to live according to a truth that he knew and to create a cult that worships the one God. And it is because he knew God that his fall into idolatry and vice is an inexcusable perversion. And it is also why the wisdom of the world has become folly. Far from contradicting it, the epistle to the Romans summarizes the criticism made in the epistle to the Corinthians. It's in Romans 1.22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. In the word of the cross, in the destruction of the world's wisdom, the initiative comes from the cross and not from us. As the second epistle to the Corinthians says, we do not even have the ability to receive it. Um, I, quote, I quote three uh, second epistle three five. Not that we are capable uh, of committing ourselves to a logos on our own, but our ability comes from God. We have this treasury in clay vessels, so that the excess of this power is God's, not ours. The logic of this logos is not a logic of power. It does not emanate from the power of the ego. In Paul, it obeys a paradoxical logic. God's power, I quote uh, 2 Corinthians 12, God's power is fulfilled in weakness, for whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Let us conclude. Where Heidegger destruction, uh, Heide, excuse me, where Heidegger's destruction refers to philosophical and theological statements, Paul's destruction refers to the fundamental problems that embrace all of existence. The most fundamental problem being the question, am I? For him, destruction is not only theoretical, it has an ethical and religious dimension. And above all, we are not the authors of it, but the object of it because it is God who initiates it. It is our existence itself that depends on another. It depends on an otherness that has the initiative to give itself to what is not 
and to destroy what claims to be in front of it. Divine charity. Pauline destruction is much more radical than Lutheran or, or Heideggerian destruction. The Lutheran destruction refers to a discourse that um, of the theology of glory. The Heideggerian destruction refers to concepts, those of metaphysics. The Pauline destruction refers to a form of life, the worldly life, in order to make another possibility arise, the messianic life. Thank you very much. <laughs>